The Sit Rep Podcast is sponsored by Black Sight Studio, the creators of incredible pre-color terrain. Whether you're looking for terrain in 28 or 15 millimeter, they have a wide selection just for you. No matter the type of game, Black Sight Studio has exactly what you are looking for. They have new releases all the time, and their catalog continues to grow. So the next time you're considering new terrain, jump over to Black Sight Studio, and you will find just what you need. Remember to let them know you heard from us. Black Sight Studio, the official sponsors of the Sit Rep Podcast. You are listening to the Sit Rep Podcast, your home for everything related to modern wargaming. Whether it's reviews, rules, analysis, play-by-plays, hobby time, or even gameplay videos, we will bring it all to you. And now for your hosts. From England, we have Ralph from the Great White North of Canada, Chris, our historical editor, Big Jim Ariskany, and G, both from the United States. And now, sit back, relax, and get ready for the ultimate ride into modern wargaming. Modern military gaming. And again, it is time for that bi-weekly love of modern gaming. And with us is the command team consisting, which reminds me, sorry for cutting off and going on a squirrel moment. No. Uh, I have to redo the intro um, because, you know, we've had some changes. But anyway, sitting with me here in the U.S. studio is Marty. What up? And over in sunny Florida is Big Jim Ariskany. Hey, how you doing, everyone? And over in merry old England is Ralph. Yeah, folks. And then somewhere off somewhere, trying to fix helicopters that college-educated officer types broke, is Gaz. Yeah, that's my problem. I'm dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it is now time for another exciting episode of the Sit Rep Podcast. And we've got a lot to talk about it today. There's a lot of news coming out about... Um, what are we calling it? Cold War gone hot, Ralph? Yeah, I would say Cold War gone hot is probably the best description. Awesome. So we're going to talk about that here shortly and among some other things. But of course, as always, we like to do a quick roundabout catch up and see what everybody's doing. Um, and for a change, I'm going to start. Well, because I run the microphone and the board and I can do that. Um, so here is what I've been up to. Uh, I painted the ambassador on Thursday night's live stream. Um I think it turned out pretty good. Um, so Ambassador Christopher Stevens is ready to rock and roll. I'm still not 100% happy with the skin tone. I'm probably going to um, do a little bit more work on that because it still almost looks like dead flesh. I was just going to say, he's got a little zombie side going on. Right? There. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, liven him up a little bit, shall we say. Ah, a little highlight. He'll be fine. Yeah. So uh, the ambassador's ready to go. And, you know, of course, we made a joke on the stream, if you weren't there with us, that, um, that you know, I'm doing, Gaz, you missed this one. So we were, like, doing all this work to paint up all these guys. And a thought occurred to me, no. if Jim kills us in the transit game, why are we painting all this stuff? Because it's kind of pointless anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I caught that one, actually. <laughs> So uh, I've decided not to send anything. You can pet them all yourselves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll be our reserve force. So uh, I think Jim, if I recall, uh, threw down the gauntlet and said one IED can take you all out, and that would be the end of the game. And I'm like, all right, okay. I was just trying to be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you... That works for me, Jim. I've been playing with black guys. So. <laughs> all right, so we're going to yeah, have to modify yeah, the rule the set. we were having is, is who's actually going to be playing these games. I'm just creating the uh, transit game. It would be unfair if I was actually playing it. I mean... Are you going to be like play... the game referee then? Are you? Gonna yeah, be... yeah, I'm definitely going to be there on the street. Yeah. I'm going to... Yeah, we're, I designed the game. I'll play test the game a couple times. Um, and we can have some streams on about that. But as far as the actual... Here's... You know, the project, here's what's going on. Um, yeah, I was just going to, you know, run the game. I don't think it would be fair to either the Libyan militias or the uh, the GRS uh, security people if, you know, I was playing the opposition, you know, being the designer of the game at all. Yeah. Thinking we need to add a Predator drone to, to the, the, the rule set. Game, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the tank and the aircraft carrier and the artillery strikes and the hellfires, you know, there's a lot going on. But uh, no, we're just kidding, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Those militia were really well armed. It's strange. Yeah, no, it's, it's nuts. All of a sudden they had, you know, like laser right repeaters from Star Wars or something. It was great. <laughs> That's all right. 
we're up for the challenge. Honestly, we are totally up for a challenge. So I'm good with that. So that's kind of what I've been working on. I'm going to finish up some of the baddies that I have here. Um, I need... Dawn made an excellent point. Uh, we're going to put together a list of all the minis we've already got created so you kind of keep track. Um, also... So, also... Um, all, all the um, all the GRS operators are now complete, right? Yeah, GRS are yep. complete. Uh, the ambassadors right. complete. Uh, we have to work on the uh, we were talking DS about how agents. Many, yeah, how many actual DS agents were going to be in there? And then, yeah, you're just going to need a whole bunch of uh, yeah, a whole bunch of malicious. And then a couple of vehicles. I did order and them, but something fab as well. Um, I have to look at the order because um, Foot Sword Miniatures uh, US canceled part of my order for the vehicle so i'm not sure what's going on with that i'll have to reach out to tim and see what's going on there but um but yeah we need to get those vehicles and right now uh per the timer i think we're at just 11 days left in our yeah. clock so yeah and i've got the i've got the technical um and that's uh been you know, 80 percent uh, assembled I, i've left some of it in sub-assembly because it's easier to paint that way yeah and it's got a base coat on it but it, I wanted to save that for the live stream, so I haven't done anything. I can barely hear Marty. <laughs> Got to talk louder, Marty. Can you hear me now? Can you hear him now? Well, it's going to be kind of hard to hear Marty on Skype, but we're hearing him on the recording, so just talk uh, a little louder. Happy days. So, all right. Oh, so by the way, guys, um, because I'm an idiot and I'm acknowledging this, I hit stream instead of recording, so we're actually streaming and recording at the same time. So, oh well. Yeah. Oh, well. Nothing like a live performance. Right? Right. <laughs> That's work under pressure. That's right. So uh, so does that cut down on post-production? Because, well, it's already out there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I'll, I still will put our music in there. And uh, if you guys have noticed, we're adding a lot more music because I got us an unlimited music license to stuff. So um, we're going to start upbeating some music here, guys. So it's all I was, right. I, I believe Gaz sent a suggestion in earlier. Yeah, Gaz sent in a suggestion. <laughs> I don't know if I have the license for that one. So <laughs> I was disappointed uh, there yeah, was no video. Was a choice moment. Yeah. <laughs> Let the bodies hit the floor. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so that's pretty much what I've been doing. Uh, Marty, what how about you? Well, uh so I uh you know, as as I've talked about the past couple times, I've been working on, on crisis protocol and I'm proud to say that I completed my crisis protocol miniatures. Nice. And then last Sunday I had a meltdown and stripped Spider-Man in my two cars. <laughs> okay. Spider-Man kind of looked like a, uh, epileptic three-year-old that was over caffeinated, went at him with a chubby crayon. So, and I couldn't fix it. So we're starting over. And then, uh, maybe I should stay off the internet. I saw somebody else's, uh, terrain and their cars look magnificent and i'm like I, I i i gotta raise this up so i strip them and they will need to be repainted but uh well okay so that leads us to a point we've talked about on the show before don't judge your work by others on the internet because it'll just drive you crazy because there are some people that are just so yeah. ridiculously talented you will never replicate or get close to it and you'll just frustrate yourself and it could even turn you off from painting altogether could uh however i know that i can do better I, I, than what I had, yeah, you know. So I was I was not satisfied with with my work there. Um, Spider Man did need to get stripped. I've already got the all of his base colors down and whatnot. So I just need to do the black on him, and uh, he'll be uh, he'll be ready to roll. And then I can I'll play the game with cars unpainted if I have to until I paint them. <laughs> There you go. And then, uh, you know, Adepticon is coming up. So uh, I got a message from them that one of the wait lists I was on for a painting class, oddly enough, it's on weathering, though, uh, that there was an opening. So uh, I signed up for that. And I am in the uh, Badgers Games uh, painting competition. So they sent me a mini. I got that uh, Thursday. So I'm excited. I can I can start working on, on that little dude. Cool. Yeah. And then I assembled all of my uh, Harry Potter miniatures. So there you go. we'll uh, got them in the queue, and we'll start uh, start working on them uh, as soon as I'm done with uh, my uh, Spider Man. Excellent, outstanding work. All right, so Jim, how about you? We'll start on this side of the Atlantic, and we'll move over. Um. So for moderns, uh, we've been doing some um, Yankee Squadron. Yeah. Uh -huh. In Air War C twenty one. So that's. 
we're trying to use the Air War C21 system uh, for a, um, a series of games, maybe. So hopefully, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, Air War was set in the um, the world of Team Yankee. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's going okay so far. Now, that's um, F-16s, so, right? That was F-16s against... It was, it was two F-16s uh, from out of Ramstein Air Force Base versus uh, Fighter Aviation Regiment uh, MiG-29 Fulcrums. Oh, they were MiG-29. I, I well. misspoke. I said I thought I said Su-27s, but <laughs> never mind. No, all right. Makes, that makes more sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So for Su-27, I mean, obviously those aircraft types could have met. Yeah. Uh, they're all, you know, contemporary for the time period or whatever. Um, for an initial game, however, like just to try it out and make sure that, uh, you know, our systems are bad. Well, this is, we know the system's balanced. It's, it's, it's Wessex games. It's, yeah. it's a great little system. Um, but while the players kind of get used to it or whatever, you would put together aircraft that are similar weight class, similar flight characteristics. Um, you would put, uh, yeah, Zukoi 27s flankers up against uh, F 15s. Yeah. You know, something in a bigger weight class. So, so far, yeah, we're starting, we're starting at, you know, pretty, you know, small, high maneuverability, high speed, you know, kind of stuff. And that's going to be, uh, yeah, so far our MiG-29 Fulcrums versus F-16s over uh, southern West Germany and uh, the Fulda Gap. Um, it's going okay so far. You know, uh, we've got some more videos coming out, uh, you know, early part of, well, maybe this weekend, early part of next week. Uh, we do some, uh, we, had, we had a live game and now we're doing some walkthroughs. Excellent. Uh, we can get a, a better uh, handle on the rules. Excellent. Um yeah, and that's you know pretty much it for moderns. Excellent. So um, I have been doing some thinking, and I was thinking we would talk about this off air, but you know what? I think now is an appropriate time to talk about it. Um, obviously, our main concentration is modern era war gaming. How do you guys feel? And this is a good conversation point for everybody since we are kind of live oops um if anybody's actually listening to us right now or you know because it's not our scheduled time to broadcast um or if you're listening to this as a later recording and you want to comment in on this what do you guys feel about obviously keeping our main focus um modern but opening up the channel to all military real world war gaming so anything military related how do you guys feel about Because that would actually broaden our scope a little bit more. Um, you know, obviously I'm all about the modern stuff, but, you know, let's be honest, there's a lot more out there. Because, like, Jim, you're doing a Revolutionary War game this weekend, right? Uh, yeah, we're doing some more playtesting for Sons of Liberty. Yeah, so, I mean, and I have a soft spot for American Revolution or the War of Independence, whatever the British want to call it, Treason Day. <laughs> uh, we can call it whatever yeah, we want. A, we won. Unfortunately, a lot of American historians who call it the War of Independence nowadays. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, there's the American Civil War, um, which is yeah. also a soft spot since I had relatives fighting in it, you know, ancestors. Which um, side were they on? confederates hmm. so up, so again we can call it whatever we want because <laughs> we won up here yeah well so <laughs> it's not the, the war. south shall rise again it is not the war of northern yeah, aggressions glory hallelujah <laughs> <laughs> so, um, i don't mean to go the off best, the best part of historicon i was playing it, i was playing uh at a table at a saratoga table and the guy that i was uh interviewing I mean, he was running American Revolutionary War game, but his shirt was Civil War themed. Yeah. And it was a big picture of uh, Sherman. And the graphic underneath the Sherman, uh, he said, uh, do I have to come down there again? <laughs> I'll stop this car and I will come down, I'll come down there again. That is awesome. <laughs> well, so what do you guys think? What are your initial impressions or feelings on that? I've got I think it's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> to try and pay more models. I'm pretty sure she has some red coats kicking around over there. Well, let's see. I have um, Napoleonics in 10 millimeter uh, that I still have to do. Um, I have. Um, I, I just bought the Rorks Drift set that I've talked about before, which definitely because people are screaming for live plays you know game plays let's plays mm -hmm. um and, and as much as we love moderns and stuff jim i don't know about you but i'm kind of tired of painting green yeah i paint, <laughs> I paint a lot of green and brown 
that's true. Yeah. Uh, for moderns, what you paint a lot of is uh, desert sand. Yeah, sand, yeah. you know, olive drab. Yeah. Uh, no, I love my moderns. Don't get me wrong. It's an exciting genre, and this is what we built our foundation on, and I am all about it. But, uh, you know, as, as someone who has a love for military history, um, I, I am almost tempted – to just expand the horizon a little bit. I'm not saying we have to get crazy about it, but you know, I just, I, I feel bad because Jim has a lot of great material that he likes to do games with. And if he feels like he wants to stream a world war II uh, battle of midway, God dang it. We should do it. Right. Um, well, we've, we've bent the rules a couple, like we yeah. did our Vol river crossing. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think yeah. it's okay that if, if we, if we do it like as, as an exception from here on yeah. you know, once in a while, um, American revolution, you know, sons of Liberty, is being it was it was done and play tested. I'm redoing it because I wasn't ha- really happy. It was kind of yeah. clunky, um, and we can get into that later. But um, <laughs> miniatures wise, I've got like 400 arm, a uh, 400 figure army. Yeah. Armies, four so here, here's my only for, thing. Uh, he, American Revolution. Here's my only caveat. I if we expand our scope, I don't want us to get pigeonholed into World War II. God knows there's enough people out there that. You know, is. cover World War Two. I would like now, to see that, us. Co- that is the trap that Gas was talking yeah, about. So, that's, yeah, so that, that's the whole World War Two. I would like to see us covering some more of the, you know, outside the easy avenue, which is World War Two. I mean, let's be honest; it's easy to do World War Two. Right, you've got Flames of War, you got Bolt Action, um, you know, you've got um, Battleground, uh, you know. Of war. You know, so let's, I, like I said, I would like to explore some other options. And Jim, like I said, you've got a lot of great material. And, you know, I really want to do Rourke's Drift and do an actual Let's Play of Rourke's Drift. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it was, uh, Captain Lomax herself did some damage against the Germans in World War I, uh, Valor and Victory. If that's you right. <laughs> so. So are, are we then, are we limiting to period? Or do you want to go be able to go as far back as we want? I say we go back as far as you want. It, but here's the caveat. It has to be historical military. It cannot be right. the Tau against the space no, marines. I'm not I'm no, not on no, about no, no. no, I'm not about that 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 yeah, area is not something so, I'm interested in. But I've got um I've got a couple of the Osprey games picked up. Um, there's the Crusades one. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Is that uh, Lions Rampant or whatever it is? Lions. I've got Lions Rampant, and I've got the fantasy version of Lions Rampant. But I've got Lions Rampant uh-huh. because it was cheap, and there's a new version of that coming out, set specifically in the Crusades, because Lions Rampant's very generic. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, developed by one of the universities in the UK. Um, you know, I work in a university, and I'm interested on in how part of my job is looking at how technology is used but i'm interested in other things on how gaming can be used to educate yeah i um, mean that's so, uh, that's really what how modern or not even yeah. modern but military war game came about it was re redoing yeah. battles and learning yeah. from generals yeah. mistakes mm-hmm. yeah they're essentially so they're a tactical exercises without troops new version of line yeah. rampant yeah so and it, they, they use it in this lecturer who's produced it but he uses it in his teaching to teach history. Yeah, no, I, I 100% so, agree with so, that. You know, per, perhaps, is this Philip Sabine, if I'm saying his name right? I'm not sure there was Seven. an article up on OTT about it. Um, I've got his new version. book, um, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, how to teach via war games or whatever, war game, it's a war game design. Yeah, he's a university uh, professor somewhere in the UK. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm it, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. It might be him. I'm not sure. I saw the article because I've had conversations. This is sort of a little side. I've had conversations with some of the lecturers in education uh, <coughs> because they're in the same faculty where I work, uh, talking about using Dungeons and Dragons to teach, you know, because it teaches creativity, it teaches team play, it teaches imagination and creative writing. Yeah. You know, and Wizards of the Coast have produced a collection, cut down versions that you can get in PDF of D and D to be used in schools and it's K twelve and above. So you know it's it's all of these different things and something I'm interested in. And also from a, a, a military gaming point of view is there's that new rule set that came out and I think it's Footstore have done the miniatures, which is the Baron's War. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. It's guys you might be able to correct me on this. It's the it's the 
the barons within the UK, the baronies within the UK, and it was the wars between those barons. So like the barons of the Northumberland, things like that. It was before 1066, I think, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so I think it that. is. I've, I've seen it, but I've not yeah. read that much into it, to be honest. I've not read much into it, but it, the minis are very much of Norman, Saxon, you know, that yeah. period. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, okay. so is nice, this like, so... the, like, like uh, the four kingdoms of what would become England? It wasn't even really England yet. It was uh, Mercer, Wessex, um, and these are the four kingdoms that weren't really united until the uh, Viking invasions in the 8th century? Yeah, that type of thing. Something it's... like that? Okay. <laughs> It's um because there was two barren wars in the UK. There was the first barren war of twelve fifteen to twelve seventeen, which was a civil war inside of the Kingdom of England. I'm just bringing up some information on the web here. And then there was the second barren war, which was um, Simon de Montfort and against the royal royalist forces. So it was right, a number so of barons. Later with the whole Plantagenet. Yeah. And, and, okay, I got you. Yeah, um, that'd be interesting. But, but there's a collection of mint. There was a Kickstarter done. Uh, Baron's War. I'll bring up the Kickstarter and see what it was. Um, 28 millimeter miniatures. It was sculpted by Paul Hicks. So it's the so it's the first Baron's War. So it's the Magna Carta conflict. So that's 1215 to 1217. Really nice sculpts, really nice miniatures. So it was that period. And Footsaw posted up on their Facebook page that they're working on a collection of rules. Good. For it, so it was just you know things that sort of pique my interest now. Yeah. Like I've got a, I, I've got sitting here and I'll occasionally go back and watch it. I'll sit and watch Gettysburg and I'll sit and watch um Gods and Gods and Generals. Them. Yeah, Gods and Generals. I've got them both and I've got the director's cut of them both. So there's eight hours of movie. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, those are the full long. version of Gettysburg is like four hours and twenty. And I sat yeah. and watched it all. <laughs> It's well, a good I film. own it all. I watch. Yeah, yeah. That, that's I, you know that's a weekend. That. Right that that leads me to another. You're right, Jim. It is a weekend. Yeah. So let me uh, a couple things. I want to interject here real quick, Ralph. Mm -hmm. um, the, one again, I, you know, I think by expanding our scope, I want to say scope of practice. You can tell I work in the medical field. Um, um, our scope is because we have a lot of people, and Jim, you and I both know a couple people that we have gamed with over in Ireland and online that don't want to do moderns for yeah. various reasons. Uh, yeah. And I feel bad because we, we don't get to include them in some stuff. So if we brought in the Horizons, we could bring in to the fold, if you will, Um uh, some of these people to play some of the things. I honestly have a guilty um, interest in uh, feudal Japan. So I would like to do some gaming. And, you know, uh, there is, um, oh, what the heck's the name of that game? I ha own the starter set and have never opened it. Test of uh, Honor. Test of Honor. Yes, um, there you go. And then Osprey has a rule set called Ronin, Shogun. Is, is it Shogun or Ronin? Ronin? It's Ronin, and it was in the UK. It's like seven quid. Yeah, I so I have it. it. Really, really good. So, I mean, it, it, those are things I would like to do. And uh, people... And I'm going to shout out to one of our Patreon subscribers. Just go back uh, on the Thursday night streams. Like, I want Let's Plays. I want Let's Plays. And we technically do that with Jim's Gaming, but we haven't done any miniature-based ones. And obviously, yeah. we've got a big doozy coming up with 13 hours. But, you know, there's more stuff. And I want to be able to... Um, I would like to do Avalon Hill 1776 or... Um, some of the other ones I have. I've got Gettysburg downstairs somewhere. And, you know... Um, so which one? I don't remember. I just okay. got it. Um, does it have about twenty or thirty pieces to it, or two or three thousand pieces to it? I want to say it's two to three thousand pieces. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got both, but um, yeah, there was the one that was uh, that was division level. Yeah. So like the entire um, you know, uh, rebel army, not Confederate army, rebel army, damn dirty rebels. Uh, the entire <laughs> rebel army is like. Maybe t nine pieces, yeah. Plus commanders, and then you know the the, uh, the federal army is like maybe twenty, and then there's the other one that goes all the way down to regiment, and this is like when regiments were sometimes down to two hundred people. So you've got an, uh, a war. Or, I'm sorry, a battle that is a grand total when you add both forces together on day three. 
170,000 people in 200 person units. That's a lot of pieces on the table. So uh, much more detailed, obviously borderline unplayable. If you play with some of the expansions and advanced rules or whatever. Um, and then you've got the very, very simple version. And then of course you've got brigade level games that are in between. Gettysburg is the American Waterloo. Gettysburg is the biggest battle that's ever taken place in the Western hemisphere. It is absolutely like pivotal, at least as far as our history goes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the point of that um, thing is that it's been done in gaming every level, every different angle, every, you know, it's, it's been done a million times. Um, so, I mean, you could have a channel theoretically just about Gettysburg. Yeah, right? <laughs> and for at least a year. I mean, seriously, you could have at least 20 or 30 videos. You, you have a year's worth of content just on Gettysburg. You know, never mind Revolution, never, or actually uh, Civil War, never mind Black Powder. Yeah. It's absolutely gigantic. So, yeah, there's there, there's a lot of ground there. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big topic here in the States. Yeah. Um, Napoleonic? <sighs> The Napoleonic is not something that I, I don't know about. I mean, everyone knows about Napoleonic. It's just not really my jam. I well, just, that's just fine. Don't... I mean, you know, yeah. here's the thing. By us expanding our scope, Jim, stuff you have an interest in that maybe not a lot of people play in or game in, you could bring to the forefront. Um, Ralph, same thing. Gaz, you yeah. know, it could be the uh, Viking raids along the coast or whatever. You know, who knows? I'm just throwing stuff out there. Um, you know, I was while you were um, just discussing some things, I was showing Marty three games. I haven't even opened the boxes yet. I have Victoria Cross 2, the Deluxe Edition, the Battles of Vork's Drift, and Islain Wana from Worthington Games, which was a Kickstarter. That I still maintain are actually the same battle. The, very, yeah, well, yeah, very nice looking it's box. The same I'm action, but like the Brits consider it two. One they got their ass handed to them, the one that they actually won, oh. theoretically. <laughs> um, and then you've got Worthington Games again, another Kickstarter I just got, Custer's Last Stand. You know, I haven't played that yet. And then on top of that, I got another Kickstarter for uh, Legion War Games for the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So stuff that we can, stuff that I have a passion for that we can put out gaming content for i was gonna say you've got two games for the same battle i know but they're different game system yeah yeah so you know it'd be be interesting to try the exact same battle in two different game systems and run a comparison yeah oh yeah yeah so i mean are you guys excited about the idea of this or you're like ah that's too much let's forget it i mean i I think is you know because it'll open and as you said it it, we're making a bigger tent to use a, a term that seems to be running around in certain circles. You know, we're trying to inv- inv- invite people that wouldn't normally listen to the podcast uh-huh. or be involved in with us to enjoy the hobby, you know? Yeah. And, you it's know, I think, I think I'm like you, G. I've got a, you know, a soft Tell spot for ancient, well, not ancient, but feudal Japan. Yeah. You know, the Shogun Wars, things like that, you know. One of the very first role-playing games I ever played was Bushido. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the FGU, um, game which lovely game great you know yeah so you know and i had a bunch of um uh bunch of minis from games workshop the old uh citadel ninjas and stuff so you know that was one of the things you know that that you know that that sort of introduced me into the hobby and things and you know there's there's more there's there's a plethora of games out there. Yes, there's quite a few modern games coming, and uh-huh. there's quite a few modern systems out there. Yeah, but there is a plethora of other things sitting, you know, sitting out there. Like, and we're going to discuss this a little bit later. Is this past week I got my Kickstarter from Storm in the Gap? Yeah, which is you know Cold War Gone Hot. Yes, it's modern, but it's Cold War Gone Hot, and you know that's a hex encounter game. Yeah, that could be easily transferred, creatable with with Jim's help. And doing something digitally that we could play, yeah, that would you know, work. Yeah, almost any, know. almost any hex encounter game we you can work in, um, in, in into a uh, which we call it uh, into a electronic format very yeah. very easily. As we've shown with Contact Front, we can do it with miniatures as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only games that are tough, and this is part of what we're the issue we're running across with Air War C twenty one, is games that involve cards. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. that's where it gets a little rough. Um. 
you can work around it or whatever. But uh, I mean, that's really the only reason we haven't really gotten into the whole you know ultra combat stuff. You know, uh, you know, met the guys from Ultra Combat, met the guys from Phalanx Consortium back at Historicon. You know, the great game system. I demo their games on camera. The only reason we haven't really done that. I mean, they're they're friends of the channel. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's that whole it's that whole card mechanic thing. It's um, it's tough to do that over you know just kind of a remote thing i'm sure if like you went full into d20 or you know uh, virtual tabletop or something like that there's a way you could work it but um to do it in a way that's easy for us and our, or i should say with me and our, my our current uh you know platform uh-huh. mm-hmm. yeah it's just anything that doesn't involve too many cards even then like we do with air war c21 there are there are there are tricks there are ways around mm-hmm. it um but anything hex based anything miniature based um yeah, that would be uh, that would be pretty easy. As far as opening our scope goes, as long as you do it with a couple of, um, well, okay, yeah, pros and cons. Uh, so pro, yes, we definitely should do it. Uh, I think because number one, wargaming is a niche, just in general. Uh-huh. Historical wargaming is a niche within a niche. If we limit ourselves, if we continue to limit ourselves to also modern, now we're talking about a niche within a niche within a niche. You know, we're we're never going to grow that big if we limit ourselves to that you know narrow of a focus. Right. So yeah, we should definitely expand. But at the same time, yeah, if we kind of um, you know limit ourselves in a couple ways, which I think we're all in agreement already. But just to say it, number one, historical or isn't. <laughs> is modern historical real world only yes so yeah. yeah okay number one and number two yeah let's uh let's not forget the projects we already have on the table we definitely got to finish benghazi yes most definitely let's mm-hmm. not uh yeah but let's not let, let's let's I, I can't there's nothing in the world risking me hates worse than a dropped project exactly um, i i cannot stand that so we'll finish that first and um yeah we'll see where it takes us after that. i think that's at least you know my vote okay mm-hmm. and yeah like you were saying there's a lot of people on on tabletop and other communities that i've lost touch with because um you know generating content for sit rep takes up so much time yeah and i haven't had a game of panzer leader in for, i mean except for like golf war panzer leader which almost isn't panzer leader by that point um you know in forever and there goes a couple of my players you know um we were getting ready to do uh omaha all of omaha in panzer leader back in uh for the 75th uh last year and i i mean i won't mention anyone because i don't want to embarrass anybody but i had to turn players away because you know it's it's i i might be able to do it solitaire because i can do even then it took me 25 hours of gaming i would work down three or four hours a day for over a week yeah but um to do that live would have taken you know 45 hours which would have been a great series yeah you know it could have been you know uh two months worth of content but it wasn't modern, so yeah. So, I, I, Gaz, you've been awfully quiet. What's your thoughts? Um, I like the idea of expanding, but I think there needs to be a level of focus because if we all come to the table with, say, if I come with Greek, you come with Rock's Drift, you know, and we all come with different topics, we won't know enough about the other person's topics necessarily to have discussions. Uh huh. So, if we're going to do it. I'd advise us to look at either geography and you know change episode to episode Mm -hmm. but um we need some sort of focus um to pull out stuff that we can all sort of do a bit oh that's a good idea research on and look into i I think that's where you know we can have the no no offense out but we can have the discussion around this the logistics off stream Uh uh-huh you know we can get together and we can plan out each show or have how we used to have the excel sheet you know the the sheet side of Google Docs, put some notes in there on, say, for example, guys, you're doing the Viking raids on Northumberland, as an example. You know, yeah. you can then go and do some research, look at game systems that deal with that, or model model kits and some of the history, even TV shows, Vikings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. I was, I was waiting for that. <laughs> it's a great um, show, but shit, it's not real. Yeah, we know that. And it's moving 100 years in the future. I'm, I'm going to do a Jim Ariskany moment. It ain't historically correct. <laughs> anyway. I was, I've, been, I've been re-watching Sam Adams, uh, the, the HBO series. That was good. Did you like it, It Jim? was awesome. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. It's Well, it's uh, David McCullough, so it, yeah. know, it's based on his writing. So yeah. Um, what makes me think of it, I, I think I'm going to make a meme of this or a video clip or whatever, is I think it's in the last part when um, the artist shows him the uh, painting of the Declaration of Independence. 
and he gives all these like artistic critiques and you're, you know, you're trash, you're a terrible artist or whatever. And then he turns to him and I says, I have one more thing more to say to you, sir. It is very, very bad history. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a, I just derailed the conversation there. So, yeah. No, no, no. no. I, I, so, <laughs> no, I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, that we, that we plan. Absolutely. Yeah. Gaz brings up, uh, so that's a great solution to a problem that Gaz brings up. Those are both really good points, um, interrelated points. Yeah. There's three levels of, you know, do you know what you're talking about on a podcast or whatever? Uh-huh. You're either a subject matter expert, you're conversant, or you don't know shit. <laughs> Right. You're very, very quiet. And, uh, and I, I appreciate you guys inviting me. <laughs> you guys start talking about Vikings and the Crusades and, um, you know, the, the Plantagenet Wars and then the Wars of the Roses and all that stuff. I am conversant. I can, like, hang, you know, I, I can, like, participate, but I'm not going to lead the conversation. And I'm going to be the and one going, guys, I like the colors and the swords. That's yeah, about all I, was I know. I say, that's <laughs> where I am when you guys start talking about feudal Japan. I mean, there are gaps on the Ariskeny bookshelf, and that's a big one. So, I would have to um, at least read a couple of magazine articles before I would, you know. So the opportunity to do that before the stream or the podcast would be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it's, it's. I'm excited. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I'm excited at the possibilities of this, and I just feel it opens us up to so much more. You know, with Jim, with his extensive knowledge, and you know, and some of the stuff that it, he could do in his gaming sessions, and you know, um, painting. We're, let's let's be honest, Gaz. You've really taken the helm on the painting videos, so um, yeah, pretty you know sweet. I think you found your niche with our crew. Is you you really have done a really great job. You're you're so you're like somebody said you're the Bob Ross of our group. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who Bob Ross is. Shut up! Oh, what? I don't know. You might not. I don't, I don't know. Gaz, you're a happy uh, mistake. <laughs> Uh, Tony Hawks is in the skateboarder. No, no Tony Hawks. <laughs> Tony Hawks. Don't know who Bob Ross is? Uh, okay, real quick, Gaz. It's Google a huge it. compliment, so don't don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> you need to look up. All right, Ralph. You're the quick typist. Would you send him a link to Bob Ross, please? Yeah. Which one? Do you want the Deadpool version or no? <laughs> no not the Deadpool. Deadpool. <laughs> well. Maybe that'll be the second link. <laughs> we got to give him a point of reference first. Yeah. I can't, I can't believe you don't know who down. Bob Ross a is. And a camera, and that's all I do when I get home. I don't have any. That's <laughs> Bob Ross. Yeah. Anymore. Pretty little trees. Yeah. Happy little treat. Yeah. Happy little treat. Yeah. A... <laughs> All right. Oh, it's a happy accident. It, we'll just make that into like, a bird. Like, do you know who Mr. Rogers is, guys? No. <laughs> Shut up! Oh, come on now. Everyone's ganging up on Gaz. Gaz, I got your back, man. Don't worry about it. I don't think Macaulay Culkin is. Does that count? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I just found out that Macaulay Culkin used to date Mia Kunis. He was actually married to her for like eight years or something. What? And I was yeah. like, I don't know if that makes me hate him even more or respect him just a touch more. But either way, oh, my God. You got to respect that on some I level. I mean. I'm not sure how it happened, but the background. <laughs> well, watch it later, so you'll get the idea who Bob Ross is. Um, he was a guy on public television here in the United States that did a painting show, and he was not an artist. He was actually an Air Force vet who used painting as a way of therapy, and he developed his own style of painting. And unfortunately, the real artist painters did not like him and made fun of him all the time, saying he wasn't a real artist. But millions. And I'm not kidding when I say this. Millions, millions of people love him. Yes, he's millions beloved. Of people love him, and he taught millions of people how to paint. Yes. The only reason he gets a little bit of backlash is because the style of painting that he developed, he stole from somebody else. Yeah. Um, his his former mentor or whatever. So you know, there there is there's always two sides to every issue, but overall, it's like 99 percent positive. Right? Yeah. Dude and, should have uh, got his own yeah, TV like, show. Oh, here's a canvas, and it's great for terrain. <laughs> and it's great for like when we used to build those uh, those tables virtually or whatever. Um, and all those little Photoshop stream videos. I'd be like, oh, here's some trees. Here's some trees. <laughs> yep. you know, like, and people would be like, oh my god, are you trying to like channel Bob Ross? Right now? I'm like, I would never even. I, I'm painting in Photoshop. That's not the same thing. Um, 
no, not worthy, not worthy. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's totally a compliment. And um, Absolutely. yeah, I agree. I think uh, Gaz's streaming videos have been great on painting. Yes. Um, certainly not to take away what's been going on with you over there, G. I mean, you went through all those those brown shoes on that poor uh, on the poor uh, damn brown yeah, shoes yeah, on you the suit. You love those brown shoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I. I <laughs> The way I look at it is Gaz is our Bob Ross. He takes one mini and he goes through the steps. He's very easy to listen to. He talks about it. It's a very conversant. Then you have us loudmouth yanks yeah. who sit around a table, talk crap, and try and paint some minis. It's more for the entertainment value than the actual content value of painting a miniature. So, um, I think it might be just the difference between a brew and a brew. brew. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> Exactly. I say, I, I say, I say, we rebrand these. You know, we have Gaz, how to paint a miniature, and then we have uh, the other crew over there in Chicago, how not to paint a miniature. <laughs> so, <you> people, <laughs> I we we could do it like a before and after kind of thing, maybe. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the technical when Marty pulls his finger out and finishes it. Oh, it, there's the goal. Hey, uh, G told me to, to not paint it at the house, so I've been holding on to this thing, chomping at the bit for like two weeks to <laughs> well, slap some more paint on it. On Thursday night, bring the technical. Uh, I will. I have All it here right. now, so actually. I'll put the ad out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are def So, focus number one is to finish up 13 hours and uh, get that going, and then we'll start looking at uh, next time periods. I'm excited. This is uh, very exciting. You know, um, I've been on a huge American Revolution kick lately. And I don't know what it is. Just all, out of nowhere. Just <laughs> black powder in general, but specifically American Revolution. That's American insane. Civil War is a little too big for me. Yeah. I mean, to do that realistically in a war game, I mean, Gettysburg is huge, man. Yeah. Um, granted, that's one of the bigger battles. But American Revolution is so small, and the weapons are just 35, 40 years behind. It's, there's, the British, for example, are still carrying the brown bass. Mm -hmm. And I think the tie-in there could be the absolutely hugely popular, I'm not entirely sure why, but the whole Peninsular campaign in Spain, you know, Sharps Rifles, that's, that's mm -hmm. probably why the Sean Bean series, um, the whole Sharps Rifle series, is basically the American Revolution Except in Spain, with between the British, you know, it's more guerrilla tactics as opposed to linear tactics. What linear tactics are linear light. Uh -huh. um, the the terrain is much less uh, uh, developed. You know, American colonies and you know the the back country of Spain or whatever. It's not classic um, Napoleonic, which I think it's why it's been so successful. People want to get into Napoleonics, they think, oh my God, I have to paint a quarter of a million miniatures for Waterloo, <laughs> Leipzig, Borodino, Austerlitz. Yada yada yada, or no, I can play a skirmish level game in the in the um, uh, in, in, in the uh, in the peninsula, you know, uh, sharps rifles uh, style. And American Revolution is the, uh, the biggest battle. The American Revolution is either depending on who you ask, Monmouth or Long Island. Twenty five tops, thirty thousand people total. Waterloo was tipping near, damn near a quarter of a million. Leipzig was almost four hundred thousand. So the battles are one tenth or less, five percent the size. Yeah, yeah. Battles of Ariskany, the pan. There you go. Wait, what? Is Ariskany is Ariskany into the revolution? Well, there's the Battle of Ariskany, which had eight hundred versus five hundred, and still remains the bloodiest battle per capita that's ever taken place in American history. Um. So, yeah, there's a lot to go there. And I, again, I think with the American Revolution, we could connect to um, to uh, the Sharps Rifle the crowd. Um in the UK and other parts of the world. And, and that right there is going to be a huge uh, new group of, you know, audience participation contributors, yeah. know, all kinds. Of yeah. And Absolutely. you know what? It just, two things came to mind. Marty uh, whispered it to me when we were talking about this idea. Ralph, this means you're going to have to create new logos and graphics. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> and two, this is opens up an exciting avenue for Marty and I, here in the U.S., because if we go into a time period that has firearms, we could get our hands on those firearms and show them how they really work. Yes. You go get yourself some of those Pennsylvania rifles. Yeah. Some of those, uh, some of those Kentucky Widowmakers. There you right. go. Just don't have gas around. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, oh, he did pretty good when he went shooting with us. I guess did all right. Yeah. So, a lot of ideas. A lot of good ideas. <laughs> All right. Um, you know what? I'm sorry, Gaz. What have you been up to? Because we kind of went on a huge tangent, and we never finished that thought. <laughs> I've been going out to stupid Apaches. I've been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
Christmas. Three three downed aircraft in one week. We don't have that many. We're not like the US where you got 400 in a field waiting to be used. So when three of them go down and they send teams out to each, it's a bit of a problem. So that ate up the most of my week. I was planning to do some painting on Wednesday. So instead, um, tomorrow at noon um, UK time, GMT, I'm going to pick up a paintbrush uh-huh. and get at least two minis done. Three? Oh, for the 13 uh, days yeah. project? For the 13, 13 days equals 13 hours. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> How about you, yeah, Ralph? It's been, a, it's been a quiet week. <laughs> yeah, I've been to say I've not done much this week. Um, I have been rather busy at work with some stuff coming in, especially for the the rewrites of the the medical con- uh, stuff that we need to do for the nursing program. So I've been getting home and just wanting to <laughs> chill. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> if you know what I mean, just just Great. not look at anything. Done some read, bit of, bit of reading. Um, did did some write ups for some some other stuff. And yesterday I got my Kickstarter for storming the gap, which we're gonna sort of have a chat about as well. Awesome, excellent. All right. Well, why, that's a good segue. Why don't you start talking about that, bro? Well, it's more than the news, more than anything. Um, and this is just part of it. It's um. As you know, we we sort of look at what's coming in within the next two to three months. Uh-huh. I would say, um, Battlefront announced their shall we say relaunch? Would you call it a relaunch of Team Yankee? Uh, second re- edition. It's like a rebrand, almost, yeah, isn't it? Because yeah. it's, it's World War Three Team Yankee now. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, from what I've seen and from what I've read. Mm-hmm. And, and everything is it looks like they're not changing the rules the core rule book's still the same what i thought they were redoing doesn't, it the streamline doesn't look like it doesn't look like it from what i'm from what i've seen i could be wrong could be completely wrong put my hand up um you know because i've only just sort of skimmed because team yankee's not the the system i'm interested in um i'm more interested in north Ag when that comes out okay um because i have that on order um and it's a different scale in team yankee because i was look i was thinking oh team yankee minis are they going to f- are they the same scale as what's coming out from battlefront but they're not yeah um because battlefront's 10 millimeter isn't it and from what I'm, from what team yankee's uh 20 it's a different scale um well, team yankee is 15 mil and i think north tag by we used to make battle group also psc miniatures anyway i think are 10 yeah the, 10 millimeter for 10 mil. 15 for yeah. team yankee battlefront yeah um so you know different scale and i don't want to go down that rabbit hole of i've got all these nice 10 mil stuff yeah. to buy you know 15 mil armies it's like no i'll stick with what's what's coming from north tag um with them um but it seems like there's a lot of cold war gun hat yeah stuff coming so like i said there's north Ag from from psg plastic soldier company there's also ultra combat which is Cold War Gone Heart Modern or Ultra Modern. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, when Colin, when that, when when those uh, appear from the Kickstarter, and then of course we've got uh, the new version of Team Yankee. What I did like about the way they're doing Team Yankee so much is they are they are technically duplicating North Tag with the new sets because it's British. They're concentrating fully on the British for this first run of the re-releases. Well, they have to because North Hag is the North yeah. uh, Northern Europe uh, Army Group, but this so is, that is this British. Is, so yeah, but this is Team Yankees doing it. Yeah, it's not not PSC. It's actually Team Yankees concentrating on the North part of of that that campaign. From well, that book. Not, I mean, not... it makes sense. I mean, you're it, hey, Skovac has joined us on the live stream. Welcome, Skovac. We just talked about you. I hope you caught that. We did a shout out to you. Uh, no, but to your point, Ralph, I mean, it makes mm-hmm. sense because, um, you know, when they first released, it was mostly American stuff. Yeah, it was. It was really um, so, you know, and we all know that America is only a part of the uh, NATO mm-hmm. alliance in the defense of Europe um, yeah. from the communist onslaught. Right. You know, so, um, but from a business standpoint, shall we say, or, or a relaunch, shall we say, yeah, they seem to have we're relaunching with a British starter force, uh-huh. yeah, instead of we're going to relaunch with an American starter force because the thing's called Team Yankee. 
Yeah. See what I'm saying is no. You would think yes, it's World War Three, Team Yankee. Yeah. But they seem to be doing the relaunch based around the north part of the the con the conflict and not or the, fi- the 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 fictional conflict, not where the U.S. Marines or the U.S. infantry would be based. And that is it central and south, Jim. Oh uh, yeah, I was gonna say I got a couple ideas on why they might be shifting uh, to to the uh, for launch two might be shifting most to the British. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so uh, cover art of the original book, notwithstanding. Yeah, oh, here we go. <laughs> a lot of problems with the cover art. Cover art of the original book, notwithstanding, Team Yankee, and despite the name, has nothing to do with actually being American. Mm-hmm. Um, when units deploy out to the field, uh, the mech battalions and the uh, armor battalions will start to switch companies, and then the companies in there will switch one platoon or whatever. They'll turn their homogenous. You know, this is how you organize an army in peacetime, so you only have you know it's one type of training, one type of equipment, one type of you know OOB, you know maintenance train or whatever. But in the field, that's terrible. So they'll actually do these switches, and companies become teams. Mm-hmm. So, to my knowledge, mechanized com- mechanized companies turned into teams were usually team like alpha bravo charlie delta and then the armor heavy teams were usually the last four letters of the alphabet whiskey bravo i'm sorry a whiskey zulu yankee and uh x-ray um i don't know if they still do that but again this is from the 1980s so team yankee just was almost like a coincidence or whatever now i think they kind of stepped into that quick thing with the cover art of the original team yankee rule book which is like Mm -hmm. holy team america um there's literally russian machine gun bolts bouncing off the shield of freedom uh Freedom! Yeah, it's, it's like freedom or liberty on the front of that Abrams, and there's like Russian machine gun bolts bouncing harmlessly off of it. I'm like, hey guys, I get the commentary. Okay, let's let, let's move on. Um, okay, but on a more serious note, as far as the game goes, okay, um, they, they started off with the Americans, as far as the release goes. If they're not really mm-hmm. changing the core rules or the core scenarios, there's no real reason to change what they released for the Americans. Yeah. And the American miniatures that they released back in 2015, uh, gee, you were at that boot camp with me. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with those miniatures. Mm-hmm. Now, was, was there anything wrong with the British miniatures that they released for later on in f- version one of Team Yankee? From a manufacturing standpoint, not really. But remember, for when they released the British the first time around for Team Yankee, they started off with Chieftains. Mm-hmm. Which is... Why? <laughs> why? Why? They started off with Chieftains. They're half a mm-hmm. generation behind. And then they, in order to make the British not look like, you know... They were, yeah. you know, not doing well against the West Germans compared to the West Germans and the Americans. They kind of artificially bumped up like how good a chieftain really is. Um, what they kind of should have released is what they're releasing now. It's yeah. um, the Challenger One, mm-hmm. which was in battalion strength from 1983 forward, so it would have been era specific or whatever. And British Army of the Rhine up there in North Ag would have been some of the first people to get them. Yeah. Um, so. Not to take over the conversation, but super fast, I, f- I feel that Team Yankee from Battlefront has always been, let's start off at a certain point and then correct from there. So mm-hmm. between Red Thunder releases, moving Fate of a Nation out of Flames of War into the Team Yankee uh, universe, um, expanding it into Oil War, so you include things like Bright Star, Sword Point, maybe even Desert Storm, if you want to get historical about it, what they're doing now with the British with version 2. There's, it seems to be like a history of, okay, we started off here, now we're going to correct. There's yeah. a lot of corrections, which are, you know, the right moves. I'm not trying to criticize battle Battlefront by any means. Um, they're, they're making a lot of correct decisions, but they're almost like, here's what we released, now let's fix it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the starter set, the British starter force, which, I mean, some of this stuff that I've got pictures of and things in front of us isn't, isn't released until March. Um, so it's not available now. Well, you can get the, the individual bits probably from version one. Um, but the British starter force, you're getting five challengers now, uh, two chieftains, two Milan anti tank vehicles, two scimitars or scorpion light tanks, four foxes, two MLRS rocket uh, units, two lynxes, the rules and the cards. Is what's coming in the British starter force. That's a pretty decent starter force for that yeah. game. I mean, compared to the old starter sets you got, some, um, some decent horsepower there. Yeah. Um, I just want to do a quick shout out since we are live. Uh, Scoback has joined us. Hello, ever Scoback, and Gareth White has joined us. Hey, how are you doing? Um, let Annie know that I need dice bags if you happen to have her around. <laughs> 
I will be make sure I get that order put in. Um, no, that's a good setup. But you know what, uh, Ralph, I'm still set on the 10 millimeter. Um, yeah, me too. Set for um, <laughs> you know North Egg. I, I mean, ten, obviously, ten or even six. Yeah, six. The, the, I, I I built my my Battlefront um, 15 millimeter Team Yankee Force, and they're great models. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly don't think I'll ever use them. Yeah, it's table. just too big. It's, I mean, yeah. it you create even on a let's be honest, even on an eight by four table, it's at fifteen mil. You're creating a parking lot. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even if you're only doing one squadron of tanks, you know. Um, so what's a squadron of tanks these days? Um, help oh me. God, it's okay, what? Hold on. Is it we're nine tanks? About, are we talking about British? Or are we talking about American cavalry? Well, let's, let's talk American because that's what Use I'm American because you probably got the. Okay, so Americans. I don't think cavalry. I think a, a troop in cavalry is a company. Yeah, right. So it's what okay. nine tanks? Not 10. fourteen. Fourteen? No. Yeah. Three platoons of four, and then an okay. XO and a CO. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. That's that's a training. Now, what happens? I, I won't go through it all again. But what happens is once you go into the field. These homogenous units get – they start to switch component units out. So like we in the literal novel Team Yankee, um, that's a, what you're actually seeing there is an armored company of, again, 14 tanks that has been loaned to a mechanized uh, battalion. Yeah. yeah. So, I think it's first of the 78. So doctrinally, the uh, U.S. forces research. will so split into task force. they switch out yeah. one of their mech platoon or one of their armor platoons for a mech platoon and then they get some ITVs. So in that case, now you're down to 10. Two platoons of four – of tanks, an XO and a CO, and then you have that attached mech platoon, which in Team Yankee, the novel was M113s. Nowadays, it will probably be, be Bradley's. Yeah. Along, yeah. along with some ITVs, if they even still use ITVs. I think with so many um, uh, M1, uh, I'm sorry, M3s and M2 Bradley's uh, carrying toes, I don't even know if they're going to use too many more ITVs because the ITV is the old M113. The whole reason they created the Bradley was they could, you know, the M113 couldn't keep up with the uh, speed wise, couldn't keep up with the, with the uh, Abrams anymore. So, yeah, uh, and then there's combat losses, mechanical failures or whatever. So, yeah, anywhere between like 10 and 14 is a full strength, quote unquote, um, American company slash troop if you're in the ca- if you're in the cavalry. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. I'm getting that right. If anyone's at Fort Irwin right now and, you know, hit the roof, I apologize. Uh, and then just let me know in the comments. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you on, on it as well, G. I mean, the, the, it's a nice start. That's a nice start, a group, that, that British starter. But compared to what you're getting from Mam going off, shall we say, what you're getting for your value with money, mm-hmm. I think when you look at what was coming from the North Tag starter and the amount of things that you're getting, yep, I think it's better, better um, quality for the amount of money you're getting. But also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is I have the rules sitting there. I skimmed them. I never really looked. But did Team Yankee have the rules for infantry in? Uh, yeah, there was a, there was rules for infantry because of the American infantry had, rules. They yeah. did, didn't they? I want to say the yeah, yes. Yeah. But, um, Team Yankee was sort of the test balloon. <laughs> Excuse me, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Team Yankee was kind of the test balloon for what was going to become fourth edition um, Flames of War. Uh, Flames of War, yeah. So it's not Flames of War, but it's kind of like a related cousin to you know Flames yeah. of War, and therefore it's. Yes, they have infantry and artillery, but let's face it, it's about tanks. Tanks, mm-hmm. more tanks. We like tanks. We love tanks. We want more tanks. Can I have more tanks, please? All right, yeah. Um, and that's great, but the problem is then you run into scale. Tank combat takes place at 2,000 meters plus, mm-hmm. um, at least if you're the uh, if, you're, if you're a NATO force. If you're the Russians or the Iraqis, well, not so much. But well, It still no takes what, place at that scale. It's just uh, you're receiving. too big to fit on an 8x4 table. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just, just you know, you look at, at the, the North Tark stuff and things, and you're getting, as well as getting the armor, you're getting the infantry support as well, which would be involved in, you know, any conflict that is, say, for example, the Russians breaking through, they would maybe send infantry in either before or after the tanks to secure areas and things like that, where with the starter set from Battlefront is there's no 15 mil uh, infantry in those sets. You know, that, new, and, that that new British force doesn't have any infantry at all? No infantry at all. It's all that's, vehicles. That's a little weird. Yeah. Wait, uh, I, guess they assume people, I guess they assume people already have infantry? That doesn't but, make any but, sense. 
there's no infantry. There are no infantry in this in this in this in that British starter set or any of the expansion sets that they're they're coming because there's the Fox Recon units by itself. You can get you can get some 109s. Uh-huh. Uh, you That's can get the song, yeah. Yeah, but you, you, can you mentioned you can some get, yeah. uh, some some warriors, right? The MCV 80s are those in there? No, there are there's, no warriors. So there's, you know what this leads me to believe? There. This is what yeah, leads me to believe. Starter set with the anti uh, the anti tank Milan setup. Yeah, but they're not as. Um, but they don't have the infantry. You know the disembark things like that. Yeah, or, and no you know, the door. There's there's no infantry per se. So in, in in those sets. So this goes back to one of the original formulas for Battlefront with Flames of War. Mm-hmm. It's all about tanks. Yeah. It, oh, it, yeah. It, it, it's 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 not really the infantry was an add-on at some mm-hmm. point when somebody said, you know what, this is not a complete, complete quote unquote World War II game because there was a lot of infantry battles. But what's cooler? Infantry or tanks? Well, we know what's cooler, but Tanks are not cool, but, you know, unless you're a treadhead, um, helicopters are cooler than tanks. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's my opinion. Um, well, tanks, helicopters, or infantry, yeah. any of them are getting chopped into, you know, sushi if they don't have the other two. Exactly. Support. That's yeah, the point. It's combined arms. You yeah. don't drive tanks into a city without infantry. Yeah. You know? Um, you're getting two warriors with the, as, as God said, it's two warriors of the anti-tank yeah. variety. Yeah. Oh, so they don't have like the thirty millimeter turret on that they just have the Milan launcher? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the thirty mils are on the Scorpion and the oh whichever variant you set it up as. Scimitar Scorpion. Thirty yeah. mil onto that. Right. So the other thing is as uh, Skovac said, um, Battlefront starters are low uh, uh so, battle, sorry, I'm reading this and I'm dyslexic. Battlefront starters and Flames of War and Team Yankee both are super light in infantry. Yeah, because they're Tanks sell, infantry doesn't. Mm-hmm. I think I think they they're again. I'm not trying to bash them out by any means. I don't think they they're that worried about a precise operational yeah. doctrine or tactical theory. I think they know their audience. Yeah, and their audience want to build tanks. And again, those them those uh, those M60s I have for the Marines, they came out great. Yeah, uh, they, they they build great tanks, tank miniatures. Um, again, you can get away with more detail on 15 mil. Um, to talk about actually playing. Team Yankee. I think a lot of the reason Team Yankee gets kind of a, a not so 100% um, you know, bill of health is because people play it in 15 mil. I think if you took the Team Yankee rules, which I'm not an expert on, but I have played it uh, at a number of tables, at a number of venues. I mean, we started off at that boot camp that G and I were at. If you take Team Yankee and you play it with six millimeter miniatures, don't change anything. Just play with different size miniatures. That's going to go. That's going to fix half of your problems. I've said that before. Yeah. That's going to get. That's going to get rid of your tank. Um, it's going to get rid of your tank uh, parking lots, or at least alleviate them to a great mm-hmm. extent. I agree. Because those tank. Because number one, the tanks are too big um, for the table. The table's too small unless you're playing on a tennis court, which would be nice, but not all of us can do that. And then number two, this, the other thing that we don't talk about a lot of times is the command rules, especially vis-a-vis the Russians. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have your units within a certain degree so that the commanders can exercise control over each other. I don't know exactly how much sense that makes in the age of radio, but at the same time, it does force a certain amount of real-world Soviet doctrine into your into your Soviet force or whatever. It also allows you to do that Mexican jumping beam mechanic, which is not one of my favorite parts of Flames of War, slash Team Yankee, where you know you hit the commander's vehicle, and oh, wait, the commander wasn't in that vehicle. He was in this vehicle. And, you know, it's yeah. almost, you're almost playing a shell game by that point. Right. Um, yeah, you shoot one of the tanks, you aim for the command vehicle, you shoot at it, and then the commander can jump, and it's like... It's a shell game. He, he, he's an electron in, in a quantum state. You don't actually know where he is until yeah. you observe him. You know, it's like, come on. I understand why they did it for game mechanics purpose. It's so that you can't just snipe enemy commanders. But in other games, you have to protect your commanders. You know, mm-hmm. the game puts that responsibility on you as the player. When the when you know your your commander just like quantum states between different vehicles, are you really playing the game at that point, or is the game playing it's, you? Exactly. Schrodinger, Schrodinger, you know, Schrodinger's and, tank is, again, is the commander alive or dead? I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. It's, we're having a really tough time hearing you, Marty. So if we ever talk it, over you, I apologize. It's, uh, it's, it's Schrodinger's tank. tank is the commander alive or dead? <laughs> Right, there you go. Schwerner's <laughs> That's exactly correct. Um, and again, it's a it's a tournament thing. It's a game mechanics thing. I totally understand that. I just, um, 
all that said, you know, I still like the system uh, overall. Uh, the miniatures are awesome. I just, you know, if you play it in six mil, and that's going to solve a lot of your issues. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, you know, with them, with them p- pushing this out and putting it out, you would think a complimentary collection of infantry to go with the starter would probably, you know, and then allow for that that um, mechanic of having infantry in buildings with say anti-tank and you know avoiding small villages and things like that if you've got them on the table because the flames of war starters had infantry in them and you know there's infantry available though I was going to say that stuff came out in the first group. You can get the mechanized infantry group and a platoon Mm -hmm. and the company. Sorry, Um, they are available. Um, Yeah, it's just not a starter set. Yeah, but I'm I'm wondering if they're retooling to put them in plastic potentially. You know, like they did with the Flames of War stuff. I'm not sure. I think these are these might be the plastics. These may be the the new. I would think they have. I don't think they're resin because what would we have resin? Was it? Oh no, no. I mean the. So I'm not sure. Are the old infantry? So the Team Yankee British infantry Um, are they plastic or metal? I had to buy Plastics. for my for my marine for my marine force in Gulf War. I bought the Ryan's Leatherneck box that didn't come with a single infantryman. Um, I had to buy that separately. The U.S. and it's not U.S. Marine, U.S. Army. It's just U.S. Yeah, U.S. Infantry platoon and um, great miniatures, and they were all metal. So I don't know if the British are the same way. So I understand why maybe they don't like re-release a new set of British infantry. I they, they already have it. But uh, to to uh, Ralph's point, yeah. How about you throw a couple squads in the starter box? Yeah. If, yeah. if, you, if a... you're wanting people, if you're wanting people new to the game to come to the game, yes, tanks are all shiny and pretty and things like that. But you want people to, you know, have a experience of so we say everything. That's yeah, the I mean the, the whole point of a starter box is like an army in a box kind of a thing. You know, yeah. here's a little bit of everything. Is well, it possibly I because um, modern infantry? With anti-tank, make tanks and built-up areas obsolete. No, you no. Know, here's here's what I'm thinking. Little, you know, anything it hits, pretty much. Yeah. Well, here's what so I was it's, thinking. It's a one-shot deal. Um, when they created Team Yankee, remember it was based on the book. And in the book, if you've read the book, ninety percent of the action yeah. is not infantry; it's tank on tank. Mm-hmm. So if they're following the book. And hence why the Americans versus the Soviets is why you got the sets you did. Now, in one part, you had the mechanized infantry. Because you remember, if you, you had, um, was it a platoon? I'm trying to remember. I think yeah, it was there, a platoon that was attached. There's a platoon attached to Team Yeah, Yankees. and they're the ones who raced into that village in the valley. Um, but yeah. most of it was tank on tank. So if, if at that point when they created the game, they were following the book, that's why it is. But now that they've expanded to quote unquote World War Three colon Team Yankee. They need to have more infantry. They need to have more weapons. They have you know, they need to expand it a little bit. Now I don't know if they're exploring we're gonna start in the Northern Army group and work our way down or what the their the line of thinking is. Um, but you have to have infantry. I mean otherwise yeah. are we gonna have nukes and we're just gonna nuke people? You know, game over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of the Milan group, which is platoon size, uh, is ten bases. Each base is a Milan launcher. Yeah. So essentially, it has ten Milan shots a turn. That's a little ridiculous. <laughs> Against that, five that is... challengers, for example. <laughs> well, that's yeah, a that... again, I mean, welcome to modern war. Uh, <laughs> read about, yeah. read about black. Of... Um, yeah. Black Black Monday, eight October, nineteen seventy three. The Israelis lost their entire the vaunted IDF armor force. Died in a single day. Didn't even see an Egyptian tank. That was nineteen seventy three. Imagine what it would have been like in seven in, uh, in eighty five. Yeah. Um, now again, that's the dirty little secret okay. of historical wargaming. Not every battle makes for a good game. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. we're pretty well, much sure how Little Bighorn's going to turn out. Um, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Hold on there. <laughs> everything. I was hoping I was going to get away with that. But <laughs> as far as Team Yankee, okay, so Team Yankee, the novel goes, like you said, you know, these units trade, you know, so you, you, you take one company of tanks and you put it in a mechanized battalion and then, okay, so now the battalions have traded one company each and then within that, comp- within that, the, each of those uh, battalions, those companies trade one platoon each. So Team Yankee was, again, two, a, a tank command group, two uh, Abrams platoons and one mechanized company. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, platoon. So in Team Yankee, the novel, the original Harold Coyle novel, yeah, 
the infantry played a supporting role only. Two platoons of tanks, one platoon of infantry with a tank command element. If that book had been called Team Whiskey or Team Zulu or Team X-Ray, or, you know, it would have been opposite. It yep. would have been two M113s mm-hmm. as a command vehicle, two more platoons of five M113s each with 40 or 50 troops, and then maybe four tanks. That's when your tanks pretty much just set up on the high ground over the infantry and try to provide fire support. Um, so both are, you know, uh, valid. Both happen equally, you know, in equal numbers. So in fact, probably the infantry, it, 90% of any army is infantry, you know, no matter what anyone says. So, yeah, it, uh, when you said, when you start, when you use Team Yankee as your starting point, the Harold Coyle novel, mm-hmm. it's going to be mostly tanks. That's probably one of the reasons they picked it because Flames of War has always been a very, you know, tank heavy kind of a yeah. ecosystem. Um, but again, when you're playing Team Yankee, you're not playing Team Yankee, the novel. You're playing Third World War in Europe by mm-hmm. Sir John Hackett, the novel. That's the verse that he put his book in. So that's where you get your British. That's where you get your West Germans, your Czechs, your Poles, your you know your East Germans. And it expands. And that includes other units that you didn't see, like mechanized heavy teams or mechanized platoons. And that's where, yeah, your infantry have got to be in there big time. I agree 100%. Yeah, it's just, it's just you know, from a starter point of view, you would think. He has a starter set. There's, say, two infantry platoons to go with your warriors um, or things like that, you know. And it just. That's like a warrior's job is to carry infantry. It's, it's an yeah. easy crying out loud. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. I mean, what's the purpose of having Bradleys when the Bradleys come out if we have no infantry? I mean, it's not an effective fighting vehicle by any means. That's Hell, the M113 is not an effective infantry. fighting vehicle. Oh, well, no. The M113 is a battle you taxi. Have to ask between the M3. Calvary or the M2 Bradley. They're technically the same vehicle, but different loadouts. One carries more missiles, one carries more infantry, and obviously most of them are Bradleys because that's what you need. It's yeah. you need to carry it around the battlefield. It, it might be like you said that you know tanks are sexy. You know you get helicopters in there as well. You get into tanks are not sexy. Helicopters are sexy. <laughs> the Lynx isn't sexy. Jeez, triggered. No, the Lynx isn't sexy either. Um, but you know you're getting you're getting the vehicles that shall we say people will gravitate towards yeah it's probably the better way of describing it isn't it you know from a from a starter boy box you get those those elements in there and you know and you know each to their own for you know i not a fan of the rule system yeah but i do like the miniatures the miniatures look really nice the miniatures do look very very nice i even bought the battlefront you know the colors of war book that they did yeah uh for painting purposes to help, you know, do some of my World War Two stuff and some of the the moderns, um, and I'll be using that to paint up the British when I get the North Tag um, sets coming in from PS Plastic Soldier Company. So you know, I'm um, sort of moving on from you know uh, the the shall we say my bashing of Battlefront. It's not meant to be, but you know, um, um, we've got the North Tag which we've covered as well, and then we've North got it's going to be a lot more interesting. Oh, yeah, super fast. Sorry, a lot more interesting right. when they bring in West Germans and uh, and Americans. Yeah, when pretty much when they call it Centag or when yeah. they bring in the Centag expansion, that that's when I, that's when my ears come up. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's loosely based on battle group. Mm-hmm. I know we, we had that discussion with Pierce where it's not really battle did, group. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's like battle group plus or whatever. So mm-hmm. sold. Yeah, uh, it's, sold. It's, right know, we've, sold. we've had we've had PS on here. You know, we've had the conversation about <laughs> yeah. stuff, and yeah, we need to get him back on now that it's going to be coming out here. Soon. World War II miniature system I've seen. Mm-hmm. World, I mean, uh, that, not my favorite war game, but World War II miniature system battle group, and anything that's based on battle group automatically has my money. Just give me some West German and American vehicles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when PS was on, that's what sold me for it was Tim talking about it and having the conversation about the system with him. Um, you know, so that's due February, I think they said to start shipping. Um, and then soon, is well, it I, March? I, I had a look at the website. Might be February. Yeah, it might be March, February, March. And then it's going off to salute as well. So, Well, um, I can't wait to get it because I know there's a lot of people who are very excited to see our opinion of yeah. it and get some Let's Plays mm-hmm. going. And then, of course, we've got Colin. Um, hopefully... 
that they've sorted out the issue with the um, sculpts for his miniatures. Yeah. And then we've got Ultra Combat, haven't we? That's, yeah. that's coming. It will be interesting year. to see what the difference are between the new uh, sculptor and the, mm-hmm. the old one. Because I have some yeah. of the original sculpts for mm-hmm. Ultra Combat. Uh, the Americans, I have both, actually, Americans and mm-hmm. the uh, Russians. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what has changed in comparison-wise. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. It's, it just seems that there's a lot more we're on the horizon from a point of view of Cold War Gone Heart or the con the the, the possible conflicts with Ultra Combat. Yep. Along that European East West border. You know, it just seems to be of raising its head a lot more. Is that because of the outside factors or is it just people think it's an untapped area? That's a good question. That's that that that's moved in you know i i i'm like jim i remember you know i've I've still got sitting on a shelf out the back here and playing it in the late 80s um twilight 2000 yeah oh that's that's you know so so, that's a deep cut that's going way back that's a yes (laughs) yes first edition as well jim um no man not second edition um so you know it just seems that that some of these gaming companies, uh, especially the ones that are doing modern conflicts, are looking at what's untapped. What can we sl- slot ourselves into to find something new? Is it all based on the success of Team Yankee? I don't think it's based on Team Yankee's success. Okay. I don't know. I'm asking. I, don't... I Personally, I don't think it's uh, uh, based on the success of Team Yankee. I don't know how successful Team Yankee was. Well, it's all pretty much started since 2015, right? Yeah. November 2015 is when Team Yankee kind of rolled out. Mm-hmm. And uh, before that, Cold War got hot pretty much. I mean, okay, Force on Force had a book for it yeah. back in, you know, God knows when, but that was it. I don't remember seeing that much for it. In the 80s, it was big because in the mm-hmm. 80s, it was like, oh, yeah. holy shit, this could actually happen. Mm-hmm. Team Yankee was a game in 1988 by, you know, GDW, the f- part of their first battle series. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not the first people to tackle this subject. Um, the whole Tom Clancy and then all of Tom Clancy's disciples, you know, Larry Bond, Harold Coyle, uh, you know, all these other writers. Sort of, yeah, that's pretty much mm-hmm. the birth of the techno thrower genre. But then it went away in the 90s and aughts. And then some point, like, like you guys are saying, you're totally right. In the middle of the uh, middle of the teens, everyone's doing cold war hot again. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know much about the market, but the first one seemed to be, uh, seemed to be team Yankee. And then a little bit after that, we see PSC with, with, uh, North And then we see, Mm -hmm. you know, these other, these other titles come out. So I, I don't know. And I mean, this, this past week as well as, um, there was a Kickstarter came out last year, which is right up Jim's alley because it's Hex Encounter, um, uh, storming the gap, which was world war at, at world at war 85. Uh huh. Um, which I've sent the rules through because you can get the rules free from Lock and Load Publishing. Is the company behind it? Now I know, gee, you've got some Lock and Load games as well, haven't yep. you? Yeah, sure do. Um, so, and they did this this basically Cold War gone hot, um, storming the gap thing. But what's interesting about their rule set because it's, yes, it's based on hex encounters on the cards because it's uh, for the unit cards. It's got the ranges in inches for the different scales of miniature. Oh, cool. Okay. 6, 10, 15, 20, and 28. I think 28's on there. Nice. So you could take the cards and the rules and then technically do it as a standard tabletop game. Okay. Um, I think you may need still a hex, you know, a hex layout for um, movement, but I'm not too sure. I haven't had a look. It was just something I noticed in there. You know, the stuff when the Kickstarter hits and they show examples and says this, this, and this. It was just something that was mentioned in there. And then when you look at the unit card, you can actually see those ranges broken down for inches and things. Uh huh. So, you know, it looks like this rule set could be used as a rule set for doing stuff with small scale miniatures. Okay. So is forward. is storming the gap more of a more of a tactical game than an operational game? It would have to I be if you can think. No, I think it's. I think the units are a say. It's not an individual unit. I haven't had a look proper look at the rules okay. yet, Jim. Um, it came yesterday. <laughs> it's well, if it, if it converts into miniatures, copies. it's got to be some kind of tactical game or a miniature game with ranges. So yeah. it might be like you know a, a single miniature will be a platoon or you know command that's, tactical. That's what I think it is. 
what I've done is I've shared the rules with her. So the PDF rules that were free, I've linked, okay. I've sent that to everybody so we can all, if you want to have a look at the rules and download them, they're free, uh -huh. you know, off, off their website. It's off the actual uh, LMP website. You know, you can get them for free. So, gotcha. so it's in PDF format. So, you know, we could all have a look at it and see what people think. But So for converting, because this, this is something that comes up a lot, for converting a Hex Encounter game to miniatures, mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of great games. A lot of people want to play miniatures. So I've, I've dipped my toe into this, you know, uh, mud puddle before. Um, <laughs> it's possible. It sounds mm -hmm. very simple. It depends on the game that you're trying to convert. Because a hex grid does basically three things in a game design. A hex grid, number one, handles range, which is the easy part. You put a number yep. on the card, like Ruff was saying. It handles movement, which is usually pretty simple. You break out a ruler. Oh, like Battletech does this. Um, you can play that on hexes or in miniatures or both. Um, that's like a hybrid Ooh, game. You literally just take a, you know, one inch per, 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 instead of one inch, it's one hex. Okay. Whatever. Or vice versa. Where it gets a little weird is hexing. Hexes also mm -hmm. manage facing and weapons arcs. If that's part mm -hmm. of your game. Yeah. And that's where battle tech starts to fall down a little bit when you do it in pure miniature. And, uh, I don't know about storming the gap, but I mean, that's what I was asking about. Like what level the game. Was. I can, I can tell you what level it is. Cause I've got the rules open to the page unit okay. scale, um, a counter, Re uh, represents infantry platoons of 40 okay. to 60 a count of infantry is between 40 and 60 men yep armored fighting vehicle platoons is three to five Perfect. so counter yeah. represent three to five yeah Artillery pretty much panzer leader now the yeah. reason i wanted to ask that is because okay like i said those three things that a hex grid manages mm -hmm. once you get up into that platoon level that facing matters a lot less Mm -hmm. because this isn't the American Revolution. Uh, when you put a platoon, 40 men in the field, they're not all facing the same direction. Yeah. So it's almost universal facing. You know, tanks tend to uh, herringbone out into a little bit of a, of a spread when you give them like a, a hex of ground to uh, to uh, uh, to occupy or defend or attack. Yeah. So game design, and as far as, you know, like you were, what you were talking about, Ralph, porting this hex encounter game mm -hmm. over to a miniature game, that just eliminated 95% of your problems. Yeah. Because that so, takes care of it. Yeah, facing and weapons arcs becomes a lot less important. A, a platoon can fire in a lot more directions than one tank can. And uh, so facing doesn't really matter very much. And therefore, your hex grid to uh, miniature conversion comes down to just range and movement. And that's literally a ruler or a tape measure. Yeah. Boom, you're done. Yes, because each it's got a map scale because you got the, the hex maps is in it. And the, the scale is one hex equals 150 meters. Yep, exactly like uh, so. uh, Liberation Edition Panzer Leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. So <laughs> 150 meters exactly. So that's 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 in the front of the rule, and then that is on about time scales as well. So each turn represents five to fifteen meters. So yeah. um, I want to just jump in here real quick. Skoback has put up a comment. He says the only thing that worries him about Northag is PSC's ability to make all the units in ten millimeter for all the factions they will release. Um. I am not familiar uh, that well with PSC. Have they had production issues in the past? That is their concern. Not that I've seen, okay. but I think it's I've... more the factors is, is is getting the stuff out. At re at, that I think they're quite slow. To, it's reacting, okay, and getting stuff out. I've noticed, you know, they, they they will have a release schedule, and you'll see things put up on their Facebook saying coming soon. Yeah. Um, because they've had the fifteen, they've had some Russian modern Russians they put up last year. But you know, there's there's a there's a limited modern on there, but there's a vast majority of their stuff on that website for World War Two is huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they've been they've been building up. The, so I I've, I've bought a lot of stuff off PSC, and they have a good supply chain. I've had I literally ordered the wrong book, you know, and I was able to get a real human being on the phone and switch my order, you know, like right before shipment. You know, they, they it's. Whether or like to, to Skobak's point is whether or not they have the stuff ready. I guess either from mm -hmm. China or wherever the stuff is manufactured at. Um, and as far as their very very large uh, PS, uh, their world very very large World War II uh, availability or whatever, in two scales they do mostly 15 and especially 72. PSC is mostly 20 mil, one to 72 yeah. from I know. Um, they've been building it up for years. So yeah, like I was saying a second ago, eh, I can't wait for them to get Germans or Americans. I'm hopeful, I'm waiting, but I'm not holding my breath because, yeah, to Skobak's point, that's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. um, as far as them rolling out something brand new, I don't know how long that's going to take. Mm. Uh, it's probably longer rather than shorter. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I think as well with with North North Tag is the fact that um, PS said that they'd written the North Tag rules and then they're going to possibly write the cent the central you know the rule set or the the expansion for that. You know, it'll be it'll be separate than you know the the North Tag rules. I think was what he was saying when he was on the on the podcast the last time. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Like I said, I haven't had too much dealings with PSC, so mm-hmm. um, I bought some Rubicon tanks for them for bolt action and no issues, no nothing, because they they were the ones that were selling the one hundred and five um, Shermans. Okay, um, that I wanted to put in my bolt action uh, force. So, I gotcha. Boy, it's, it's, I I think it's you know there there seems to be a lot, and this is sort of another. New another news issue that seems to be coming around this uh-huh. past week or so is there's been a lot of negativity towards some companies because they're not get uh, people aren't getting shall we say the the response they expect or um, you know the immediate response from yeah some people need to chill the heck companies. out I mean yeah I, I know who exactly who you're talking about yeah Ralph and. These people got to understand; these are not multi-billion-dollar corporations nope. with hundreds of people working for them. And it just it just irritates me that there seems to be this immediacy that people want. Yeah, I don't know whether it's because the internet and the way that we communicate on social media and things is different the way that we used to communicate over phones and. You mean like human beings? Email. Yeah, <laughs> you know, even sending an email. You know, it's, it's, yeah. you know, I work in an in. A university where we will send emails out to staff, and I will get a little frustrated because I'll get a reply back saying I'm not at the I'm not working at my office today. I'm working from home. Yeah, you know. But I understand that if they're not there, they're not answering their email. That's fine as long as they can answer it within a time scale to allow me to do my job. That's fine. But it does become frustrating. But when you're dealing with a small gaming company or small gaming companies that don't have the resources to go, or oh, I'll fix that straight away. Or they're, they're a small gaming company that say have some illnesses that is affecting, you know, yeah, you know, you do not know what pressures outside of the industry that they're in, they have on themselves to, to do stuff. And it just really did irritate me this past week when I saw yeah. the stuff. Well, Scoback makes a good point. He says it's mostly restocking delays and the pace that they can get new models out that can be long. It, it is. Um, again, it comes back to it's a very small company. A lot of these are run out of their own garage or house mm-hmm. or a very right. small, you know, workspace. Um, you know, in the case of, let's use Spectre Miniatures, because that's kind of who we're alluding to with some of these comments. Uh, somebody made a comment about how they hadn't heard from anybody since their order. And you got to remember, it's two people to do 99% of the work. Matt, who's the third partner, has a full-time job that travels around the world as an advisor, and he's the one who basically writes the rules. Um, Steven is the sculptor, and you know you got Jess who helps with the business side. So it's those two people. And um, they learned that they couldn't keep up with resin production, so now they farmed that out to another company. So, you know... There's a lot of ins and outs, so people, just be patient. Spectre has a good history of fulfilling your orders. They will fulfill it. Um, yes, it is frustrating when you go to the site when they say that it's been a restock and you go in there and everything's already sold out. I mean, it's got to say something for the company when they say restock and you go in there like 30 minutes later and everything's pretty much gone already. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and people say, well, they should up their, their levels, so stock levels. Yes, but you got to remember, it costs them money on the back end for that stock so Mm -hmm. you know they only have so much limited capital they can work with so warehouse turns are not cheap yeah so you know it's not like you pay for it then they take their cut and send the money off to the company that manufactured no they pay for everything up front and then they hope to recoup the cost when they sell the product to you at the end user so um, that depends on their supply chain if they have like a vendor managed inventory or something uh, you know then but that brings up another point i mean maybe not with the small companies but the bigger companies a lot of this stuff is manufactured where it's all manufactured in China. Yeah. And I don't want to yeah. throw too big of a, of a shadow over the podcast here, but what happens when China gets shut down? Yep. 
because of the friggin' virus. Yeah. Mm. We're already seeing, you know, ships not being able to come in and out of China, you know, travel being restricted in, in and out of China when shipping in and out of China starts to get mm-hmm. cut back. God forbid. I think we're going to have a lot bigger problems, you know, given everything that China manufactures. We're going to have bigger problems than just plastic soldiers, but it's going to have a, a big impact on the industry as well. I'm hoping not. I'm hoping to get a, a handle on this soon, but. At the same time, they might not yeah. because of you know the way things work over there. Exactly. So, um, did you have something you want to say, Marty? Well, I was just thinking that this might be an opportunity for uh, manufacturers uh, or small companies uh, that are currently doing business and having their their products made in China to uh, move their operations, uh, say, in North America. Well, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, I know there's a. I know there's a. a you know, a significant cost increase yeah, that's the for, the, for the manufacturing the cost, the uh, cost, cost of manufacturing. But, it, you know, I, I think that maybe there's, uh, you know, if somebody was set up right, that might be an opportunity for them to jump in and yeah. do something. So, I mean, it, it is tough. Um, so, you know, hey, Gaz, you still there? Yep. I, don't talk so much, Gaz, really. Today, <laughs> I mean, you've been. Uh, He's uh, painting. Yeah, he's painting. Bob Ross is painting in the studio. Um, Well, we're going to wrap up the show here because uh, one of us is actually playing games today. Um, So he's got a a time schedule he's got to meet. I want to thank everybody for a really great conversation today. Um, And I want to thank the guys that actually jumped in impromptu on chat. Uh, Skovac and Gareth White and everybody, and thank you very much. Um, so while I'm sitting here, and this was a great accidental find mistake. Um, so here's what we're going to do for future recordings. We are going to stream our recording live exclusively to our Patreon subscribers the morning we record. So only our Patreon subscribers will hear it live. Um, and they can jump in on the conversation. And then um, it will be recorded for release later in the week for everybody else. So uh, just another little added benefit to our Patreon people that you can jump in on a conversation. Um, I think that would be a nice, exciting thing as well. And as you may or may not have heard earlier, we have made the announcement we're going to broaden our scope and go outside of modern somewhat and uh, look at other military war gaming it has to be actual real life scenarios or you know past history so but no tau no, no space marines no fantasy like stuff no fantasy it has to be historical based um and well, i think histor- historical based or like realistic like yeah in the future yeah it, it, yeah yeah uh, but uh, no uh, no other genres yeah no, well, i was no going to say it doesn't doesn't a long time ago in a galaxy far far away account no <laughs> 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 no it does it's, not it's that, history, it, you know? as much as i love star wars no it does not no star yeah. wars no star trek no robotech nothing it, so it has to have a real world life foundation to it it was real. I saw it on TV the other night. Yeah, if it's on TV, it's real, right? Right. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, we want to thank you. Make sure you check out our store. We're going to be upgrading our store uh, because Marty yelled at me the other night and said that he couldn't find the sweatshirt uh, to order the sit rep uh, hoodie uh, that I was wearing. So uh, we have to go in and re- we got a lot of redesign. Uh, our graphics artist guru um, needs a new logo for us that says yeah, Sit Rat Podcast Military War Gaming or something like that. We'll have to come up with yeah. something. Um, and we will see you all. Um, Gaz, are you planning on uh, streaming any painting here in the Yes, uh, tomorrow, 12 noon, uh, GMT. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be doing probably between sort of three and four hours, maybe a little longer. Holy cow, you're um, really going for a marathon session. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to sort of make up a bit of time, so to get half, just over the halfway point. Okay. Strangely enough, I've got 13 figures, and I'm at five, so seven should just push me over the halfway. All right, so cool. And then, Jim, are you gaming anything? You've got games today, your uh, your Revolutionary War game. Yeah, we're doing some American Revolution and Dark Star today. Tomorrow, I will be on Gaz's stream. I mean, I'll be, like, you know, in, in the discussion for Gaz's stream. Awesome. And, um... Yeah, but then, yeah, we're not doing anything tomorrow game-wise. Okay. And then uh, Marty and I are picking up Thursday. Uh, Tuesday night, I am uh, working the streets of of the big city of Aurora, so I won't be streaming. Um, So I I try and reserve, like, a Tuesday night for – because, you know, with us expanding Horizon, I can now do Ultimate General Civil War 
online. So um, I might do one of the battles from the uh, Civil War online. So if you guys don't know Ultimate General, look it up. It's a great tactical uh, game. It's not tactical. It's more strategy, honestly. A strategic uh, game. Uh, this one obviously based on the American Civil uh, Civil War. Um, so um, I really enjoy it. It's a good game. Um, and until the next time, guys, thank you for joining us here at the command table for the Sit Rep Podcast, your home now for everything military wargaming. And we will see you soon. Take care. <laughs>